Well, if you think about where you're likely to end up, right, your trajectory in the in the business world, it's, it's really a combination of the quality of the decisions you make and randomness or luck. And you can't control the latter, right? You can only control, you can't control the cards you're dealt. You can only control how you play the hand. So it's, it's really pointless to worry about the things that are beyond your control. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammond. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Making decisions under pressure. That's really what it's all about. With this pandemic going around, you feel the pressure to either increase revenues, increase the level of service, um, maintain your market share, maybe even grow, create new opportunities. Decision-making is essential to all of that. As a leader, you know that the higher quality decisions you make, the more likely you are to come out on the other end of any economic downturn. Today, we have Alec Torelli. He is a professional poker player. He spent years of traveling the world, putting himself in high stakes games and really understanding the critical elements of decision-making. And we talk about those today. We talk about you know creating the space to take emotion out of your decision making. What that means. What is the the power of using logic and intuition inside of decision making? Today's episode is a special one. Alec comes from Ground Zero inside of Italy, just outside of where the, it first broke in Italy, and he's lived through this for the last six or eight weeks. He shares a little bit of that with us, but the real key to this message is about improving your decision-making. Decision-making under pressure is critical. Thanks for tuning in here to Grow Think Tank. Really excited about sharing this with you. And before you run, I have done so many interviews in the last few weeks. I have such a, an exciting time to share with you that those interviews have been organized into the 12 core principles of fast growth companies. So all you have to do to get that is go to genehammett.com slash worksheet. So you can get the 12 principles and I've been able to uh, go in there and find which episodes will align to each individual episode. When you subscribe to Growth Think Tank, you will find exactly what you need so that you can move forward. And many of them haven't been published yet, depending on when you're hearing this, but you can you can tune in to the date that means the most to you. Now, here is the interview with Alec. Hey, Alec, how are you? Hey, I'm well. Thanks for having me here, Gene. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you on Growth Think Tank. Uh, we are going to have a great conversation with you. I know you've spent years being a professional poker player, but a lot of that, uh, those skills are translating into the business world. So give us a little uh, idea of your background. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm a professional poker player and more recently been doing coaching and I have a poker training site as well. So that's a little bit more on the entrepreneurial side, but I got started when I was 16, got invited to a friend's house to play poker. And as they say of any gambler, you know, the worst thing that could happen is you win your first time because then you're hooked. And so I won $12 and I just fell in love with this game. You know, I was never big into sports in high school. I was a musical theater, but poker was something that I felt like, you know, I could beat my friends at, I could excel at. And um, I, I, I just loved the game. So I absorbed as much as I could about reading the few books that there were available at the time, watched it all on TV, and just became really obsessed with poker from a very young age. Started playing online. Um, when I was 18, I it came to a crossroads in my life where I either had to decide to go all in because I, I couldn't really get to that next level. I was in college at the time at SMU, but I wanted to travel around and play tournaments around the world. And I, I really had to choose. So I evaluated my worst case scenario and said, you know what, the worst thing that happens is I lose the money I saved up and I'm a year older. I'm 19 with no money, which is the same as being 18 with no money. But the best case scenario is that I make it and I could travel around and have poker pay for the lifestyle that I've always wanted to live while playing a game I love. So I went all in, never looked back. Um, the rest was not history. I had a lot of ups and downs, which we could talk about. I, I had a great year in 2007. It was one of the biggest winners in the world, 2008, 2009. I lost a lot of that, had kind of built it back up from scratch. So I learned a lot of the lessons there that, that also apply to my business world, like managing money and managing risk and not putting all your eggs in one basket. And making decisions not out of emotion, which we can talk about as well, um, because when you when you are investing money and you're emotional, not a good combination, needless to say. Um, and so, yeah, and then I, I moved to Macau in 2012 because 
the gaming revenue there is seven times bigger than Vegas. That was like the, the new mecca of poker. And one of the things as a professional poker player that's very much like being an entrepreneur is that you have to find where the opportunity is. And just like in the business world, you always have to be pivoting and changing because you, the business model that worked in, in 2005 isn't going to work in 2015, 2020, because the world changes. And the poker world changes a lot. And so where the opportunity was when I was coming up in my career 15 years ago is not the same place that the opportunity is today. So I had to travel around to different parts of the world to find games where I could compete in and really excel at. And so that led me to Macau where uh, really took things to a whole new level. And um, after that, I decided to build a training site and a business sharing things I've learned in poker that apply towards life and business, sharing poker strategy, as well as lessons and giving talks and keynotes as well. Well, that's a pretty good take on this. Uh, when I saw your request to be on the podcast come in, it, it took me a moment just to look at that and see how does this, this lesson of poker apply to the business world. And I know you've made that, that transition. And I thought a pretty good fit because as we record this, um, you're actually in Italy. You've, yeah. you've lived through the last what, four or five weeks or maybe six weeks of, of real uncertainty and, and fear. Um, just tell us just a little bit about that. Well, yeah, so I'm, at, I'm actually at Ground Zero in Italy. The first town that was quarantined is a, is a little town called Cadogno, and that's 24 miles from where I am. And our hospital actually here was the one that was hit the hardest. You might have seen that photo of the, the, the doctor on his knees with his hands over his face and the other nurse coming to console him. That photo that went viral is from our hospital. So yeah, it was quite it, surreal, uh, but it is a little bit like living in the future. And so uh, I've been putting out a lot of content about raising awareness about what potentially is coming for the U.S. But um, it's actually been, so the first case was February 21st and I was reading up on what was going on. So I started social distancing then. Uh, today's April 3rd. So that's about six weeks but uh, I basically haven't been around anyone for six weeks, but we've been on actually lockdown for, I think, uh, close to 40 days now, uh, which means I haven't left the house. The laws in Italy are a lot different where we're, we're actually not allowed to leave the house unless you have like a permit or a reason, which, you know, there's you have to have some work-related reason or something like that. So I haven't left my apartment in, in, in over a month. Um, so it is uh, a different, uh, different, different world, really. And um finally well, starting to taper off and hopefully hopefully we go back down. It's I appreciate you sharing this with us and, and my heart's out to you and your family and, and all the people that you probably know around you that are suffering with this and, and, and the US we're we're of course a few weeks behind. Um, yeah, that's a scary it, thing. It's 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 just replaying in a different different part of the world, you know, and it, I hope uh, hope things flatten. Well I I really wanted to have you on here to talk about decision making, but specifically under pressure. And I can't think of, um, you know, <laughs> many places where you can put yourself in position where you're under pressure, like you've got a pretty good hand and you've got to decide where you're going to put all your money into it and be out of this tournament or be out of this, this opportunity, or do you hold back and play another hand? Um, so decision-making under pressure is, is really kind of the focus today. Why is decision-making so important in the business world? Well, if you think about where you're likely to end up, right, your trajectory in the, in the business world, it's, it's really a combination of the quality of the decisions you make and randomness or luck. And you can't control the latter, right? You can only control, you can't control the cards you're dealt. You can only control how you play the hand. So it's, it's really pointless to worry about the, the things that are beyond your control. But what you have to focus all your attention on is the quality of those decisions that you're making. And so poker really teaches you this because you can't control which cards are dealt, right? You can put all your money in with the best hand and you've seen this on TV or you've experienced this. If you've played poker, there's nothing like taking what's called a bad beat, which means, you know, getting unlucky in a hand. But the winners don't focus on those sorts of things because they know that this is just part of the game. And they also know that if you put yourself in a situation repeatedly where you are making what's called plus EV decisions, means positive expected value decisions, decisions that are going to yield a profit. If you do that repeatedly, you will come out ahead. And this is why the house always wins, because they don't care if they lose one spin of roulette or one hand of blackjack. They know that if you keep betting, they have the odds in their favor. And even a small edge, like one or 2%, which the house has, will manifest a profit over time. And the same is true in the business world. If you're consistently making good decisions with 
anything, with your marketing strategy, with your executives, with the direction of your company, whatever it is, you, you will come out ahead. And that, decision, that, that will manifest over a period of time. And so that's really what poker is about. And it's really what teaches you to focus on. And so all the time I spend at the poker table is really focused on how to make those high quality decisions. Hold on for a second. Alec just mentioned constantly making decisions. Do you feel the pressure to always be right? Well, here's the thing. A lot of leaders think that they have to be the expert. They have to know the answers. But sometimes the most courageous thing you can do is to say, I don't know. Create some space for you to think about it. Create some space for your team to think about it. Invite them to actually be a part of that decision. It really will help them raise their own level of trust in you and confidence to trust their own decision-making. What you really want is for those employees to bring to you issues and challenges with decisions that they've already made, decisions that how we can move forward, bring you those new ideas and let you talk about it and see how that fits in with the overall plan and strategies of the business. Back to Alec. Let's dive into that a little bit, Alec. Um, we talked about something in, in setting up this call and, and really focusing on the best content for the audience was you have this kind of idea of logic versus intuition. Yeah. And I want to get, I want you to explain that to us, but you know, we all use logic to read the data that's coming out of, of this next opportunity. You know, we're in, we're under a lot of pressure to make decisions. Um, so logic plays a piece of it, but you have, you have the distinction between logic and intuition. Get, let's, let's start there. Yeah. So at a, I first came up with this idea for a talk I gave at, at Cisco where I was thinking about the ways that I make decisions at the poker table. And there's really three types of decisions. The worst are emotional decisions, which we can talk about later. Those are decisions that lead to problems. You make a decision from a place of emotion, whether it's in a relationship or in, in a business, that's going to lead to suboptimal decision-making. I think that part is pretty clear. But then when it comes to making those high level decisions, you really have two forces that are at play here. There's your, the logic side of things and the intuitive side of things. And most people think that these things are conflicting. They think that you kind of have to choose one. You're either a math person and you trust your head or you're an intuitive person and you trust your heart. But I actually find that it's a marriage of these two where the best decisions are made. So let me give you an example. When you, if you think about just a simple situation like you meet someone for the first time, you're, you're not using your logic to understand whether or not you like them. You're not saying something rational like, oh, uh, you know, Gene, yeah, that's a black shirt. I like black, therefore I like Gene. It's just kind of a vibe that we get. You know, we're connecting on this call, we're talking, we're having a good time. We like each other. So that's just an intuitive read that you get. And the same is true with the poker table. You do this when you're playing a hand where you are, are, are with someone and you're playing against someone and you have to decide whether or not they're bluffing you or not. And that's just an instinctual feeling you get. And that's usually something that's worth listening to. That's usually something that's right. It's your subconscious mind quantifying something that you can't explain with logic. But then what you have to do after that is you have to take a look at the math and see what the data says and say, well, wait a minute. Okay, I feel that this is what the situation is telling me, but let's look at what the numbers say. Let's look at the pot odds. Let's look at the math or let's look in the business world. Let's look at the data. Let's look at the numbers. And if I intuition says that this is the direction that things are heading, let's look at the data to see if it backs up those things. And where these two things converge and where you have your in intuition pointing to one thing and your logical mind pointing to the same thing. Those are where the best decisions are made. And I find that when these two things have a discrepancy, it's usually when you, when at least personally at the poker table, when I feel like this guy, you know, has a really strong hand, but then I talk myself into calling him anyway, those are when that's, those are the situations where I pay the price. And I feel like this is like the same in the, in the, in the real world as well. It's when you know you shouldn't go into business with someone, but then you talk yourself into it because of, you know, the resume or the opportunity or the money that's involved. And you talk, you talk yourself out of what you know to be the right decision. Those are the times we pay the price. And so I feel like this relationship uh, between these decision-making forces and poker has really helped me also navigate uh, in the real world as well. Let's go put a spotlight on this a little bit because I have been in those situations where I have talked myself out of a decision. I, I kind of felt like, in fact, I, one of the biggest decisions I made was an investment for $3 million into a business partner on a deal. And it went, it went not sideways. It, it cratered my business. This was 10 oh, years ago. Yeah. Um, and I, I overlooked the signs. I overlooked 
the, the, the red flags. And my wife even said, don't do this. But I felt confident in myself. I felt like I could move forward. Um, this intuition, uh, sometimes, you know, what, how do you sense when you're, you're in that moment of, of overruling what you really should be doing? Maybe your gut's telling you, but you're like, I really want this opportunity. Yeah, so that's where, you know, like uh, a great book by Ryan Holiday, you know, Ego is the Enemy, because it, it clouds the judgment that you know to be the space. So I feel like what people, what we commonly do in our lives, I'm speaking as a collective here, because I noticed this happening, is that we're always stimulated, we're always bombarded, we're always trying to optimize time, we're trying to, you know, have, listen to a podcast while we're at the gym, and then we're also, you know, answering an email on the phone on the side. So what I try and do is I try and, you know, you have to make space for your intuition. It's something that's like not, it, it sounds like you're kind of like wasting time when you make space to be in touch with what you know to be your, your true self, getting a little spiritual here. But, you know, sometimes when, when something simple that I'll do, in, in, I mean, I can't do this in the poker table, but in the real world, before I like go through with something, I'll think about it, I'll have a conversation about it, I'll intellectually talk about it. But then before I make any decision, I'll sit for five minutes with my eyes closed and just let my subconscious mind kind of like let those thoughts come to the surface and see if I notice anything. And a lot of times, just those five minutes, I'll come to cer like certain revelations about something where I'll be like, wow, I, I couldn't see that this was the right thing to do while I was talking about it or while I was writing the pros and cons. But because I created space to listen to myself, I came, a new idea came to light. You know, so at the poker table, what I try and do, a process that has really helped me is when you're, okay, so, so, what, 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 I'll, what, I, what I share with my clients is uh, when, I'm, when I'm doing a, a poker like lesson, for example, is like, let's imagine that you're playing poker against someone. Okay. So you're sitting where you are in your chair right now, or you're standing where you are right now. And your opponent is the person that you see. So if you're at the gym, you look at the person next to you and that's your opponent. So if I say, what is the correct strategy against this person? You're in the first person, you're in the driver's seat you know, you're the one that's playing the hand against that person. So it's hard to understand what the correct strategy is because you're, you're emotional about it. You have a desire about the outcome. You want to win the pot. You want the business deal to go through. You want that 3 million to be 6 million or 60 million. So there's all these, there's all this ego that's clouding the way of, of seeing a situation objectively. Why is it easier to give advice to your friend about what he should do in his relationship than understand what you should do in your own? Why is it easier to tell your friend what they should do in a business deal than not see it yourself because you're not emotional. You don't, you don't, I mean, you're not connected to the outcome. You don't care about, I mean, you care about the outcome, but you don't care in the same way that you care in your own sense because you're not in the first person. So what's the secret here? The secret is instead of asking yourself how you should play the hand, you should say, how should Alec play the hand? So it sounds kind of awkward talking to yourself in the third person, but, <laughs> but now you've created space. You've created space to allow your ego to subside and you're, you're actually looking over your own shoulder at the poker table, watching the entity that is sitting in the chair that you're sitting, playing the hand against someone else. So you see the difference there? The difference is that you're sitting behind Alec. You're sitting behind the person that is you and you're watching that person play the hand. So if you can create that space for yourself when you're making decisions and say, what should Alec do? in a moment where you're trying, and you can use this anywhere in life, whether you're deciding whether or not you should exercise or whether or not you should, what you should have for dinner, how you should spend your time. It's so much easier to analyze a situation when you're not caught up with your own emotional desires. Remember we talked about decision-making. Emotion is the, is motion is the thing that leads to poor decision-making. So if you could create that space and see yourself in the third person, it's easier to see a situation objectively and therefore make better decisions. Alec just said, you need to make space for thinking. And what I find a lot of leaders think that go, go, go is the best way to get more done. But the reality of it is sometimes we need space. If you look at your calendar right now, would you see the space for you to think about the decisions in front of you, to think about the strategies, to think about the, the different things going on, creating space. And this doesn't mean you know, creating space for your email, creating space for you to, to get the things done. It's literally space. Maybe your best way of thinking is taking a walk. Maybe your best way of thinking is going for an exercise. Maybe your best way of thinking is going for a drive. Whatever works for you, create the space to do the thinking. And back to Alec. I love that in so many ways, uh, Alec. I want to go 
even further into this, like, are there steps that you've taken to ensure that, you know, leaders can make those right decisions? Like, give us some insight behind that because we're, we're under pressure right now. We're, there's opportunity. A lot of people don't see the opportunity yet but there is opportunity out here for us to, to meet our market where they are and make some changes. So what are the steps behind making these right decisions and tuning into that intuition with the logic? So, I mean, one is just sort of like training this part of your, your body, right? Training this part of your mind, training this thing. So one thing I do is like, I try and be aware, like something, I, I mean, meditation is kind of like the, the exercise of your mind, right? So if you think about like, you want to lift weights and build a strong physique, you know, if you want to build a strong mind, then, you know, there's a lot of scientific evidence behind meditating. I've been doing that for years and it really helps for me personally. So that's something I would say like, is a good practice to do even 10 minutes a day. And one thing I've noticed is that I try and instill the the habit or the practice of meditation into my daily life so one thing i'll try to do is just be aware of my intentions when doing a certain activity so sometimes you're doing like one or two things and you can say you're going somewhere to do this but you really have an intention to do something else but it's masked as the activity that you're doing but underneath there's really a a, a, a different meaning or a different intention to what you're actually doing and and what you say you're doing is just the excuse it's on the surface so I try and just be aware of this. I try and I try and like observe my own thoughts. I try and actually observe, you know, instead of just having this movie that's playing and it's like kind of like I'm watching a movie that's my own life, I try and be, and instead of just living through the movie that's my own life, I try and watch the movie from afar. So I try and create space between, like I mentioned before, like Alec and my higher level intelligence. Uh, I hope that makes sense. And um, that's something that's really helped. And I think, I think having periods of the day where you have less inputs and less distractions and you block out time for creating space is really important. Cause I know at least for me personally, it's hard to do. I'm like, I, I usually live in first gear or fifth gear. I don't really have anything in between. So I actually have to consciously make an effort to say, okay, now is the time where I'm taking 10 minutes, you know, before this interview, I'm taking five minutes just to like not have any inputs. I'm not checking, instead of checking social media, I'm doing this. And so what I've tried to do is just replace, uh, allow more time for, you know, the, the, the thoughts to unwind in my subconscious to come out to the surface and just creating small intermittent blocks throughout the day to allow that to happen. And I'm talking like really small blocks because I'm, I'm busy too. I'm always in fifth gear. So five minutes feels like 50. Um, so even if it's instead of just, for example, you know, checking social media when you have three extra minutes in between one meeting or another, it's just sitting down and closing your eyes and breathing. Or like, even if you're at the grocery store line, instead of checking my phone on the grocery store line, I just follow my breath going in and out just to stay present for a second. And just training your mind to always be in the here and now is the way that you are intuitive, right? Think about it. What you're doing when you're intuitive is you're, you're silencing the, the, the chatter in your head. You're silencing your logical mind. You're silencing the noise and you're listening to yourself, however you want to describe that. And you, you need to be present to do that. You can't be distracted. You can't be having inputs on social media. You can't be thinking about all these other things. You can't be living in the, in the, in the future or dwelling in the past. You have to be here and now. And so the best decisions I make at the poker table are the times where I make these great calls because I just know the guy's bluffing or I make these amazing folds because I know the guy, you know, has a super strong hand. And I do that when I'm focused. I do it when I'm present and aware. And so I try and take that into my life as well. And, and hopefully I make a lot of, I mean, I do make a lot of mistakes all the time, but I try and always strive for that. Uh, those make those high level decisions when it matters. Alec, I want to go into a very specific term I've heard as it relates to poker and see how that relates to us making decisions in a business world. And this cool. is the concept of don't play the cards, play the man. Mm, play right? the player. It's, it's yeah. a very common thing. I don't know where I first heard it, but it's almost in every you know mantra of, of poker that I've ever heard. Uh, I think I heard it on Harvey Specter. If you ever watched the show Suits? Yeah. Um, so how does that relate to what we're doing? I, I think there is a correlation between this logic and intuition because logic is a representation of the cards mm. and intuition is a representation of what you're feeling from the, from the man you're playing. I could be wrong in this, but how do those re uh, relate to each other? Yeah, so there's a great quote by Phil Helmuth, who's one of the most famous poker players of all time. He says, you know, most people think poker is a game of cards 
played with people, but it's actually a game of people played with cards. So the cards are kind of like the superficial way of maneuvering around the psychology of the people. And, and I think really business, the business world is really the same way. And I think, you know, you think about it, it's about data and numbers and all these things, but it's really a game of people, right? If you're thinking about the business game or the, the markets game, it's a game of psychology, right? The markets, I mean, think about it. We're, we're in a situation now where the markets are imploding. Everybody's worried about the stock market and whatever. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game of psychology to a large extent, right? What, what, is the, what do the people think is going to happen? Right? Are the people in a state of panic and they're selling? Or like, think about this, this pandemic, people buying toilet paper. It's, it's like, a, like life is a game of people. And so I think really understanding people and how they behave and you know, how they behave in different circumstances and under pressure is a great teacher. And po poker is really great for that. I and mean, if you, if you want to get better at people, really playing poker is a really great uh, like, exercise to do because you get to see how people perform under pressure. Are they capable of you know, putting a lot of money in the pot with a weak hand and bluffing? Are they not capable of doing that? How are they going to react? So I think it's a great teacher to help um, to see these connections play out over time. And I think um, the people element really can't be understated. And uh, whether it's in negotiating or um, managing a team or whatever, it's all about people. I mean, your, your business, about your productivity um, or whatever it is, you know, being a great leader, it's, it's about motivating those people to perform their best and making them be inspired. Things like, you know, you see things like Simon Sinek start with why. When you have a team of people that are very motivated and compelled towards a mission or purpose bigger than themselves, they produce great work and great content and it's an, an, an inspiring team element to be around. And so that's all based on based on the people and how they're feeling and their, their psychological state at any given time. Love it. Alec, thanks for being here on the podcast, sharing with you us your insight and experience from the poker world, how that tra translates into the leadership world. And uh, really appreciate your- Yeah, honor to be here. Thank you. Great interview. Alex gets so much knowledge about how do you become a better decision maker and how do you create the space inside your own leadership to step back, remove emotion? How do you use logic and intuition? Hopefully you took notes there. I was scribbling it down, all of the details there, because I think there's some new elements behind this that if you really want to be a better leader, make those critical decisions. And this is a framework that you can use. I love being able to share this information with you and help you as a leader grow. I love to be able to help you through the defining moments of your own leadership. If you want to grow as a leader, if you want your team to grow as a leader, I love to talk to you. I love for you to, to reach out to me and see if something I could do could help you or the team through these defining moments of your own leadership and your own growth. Just go to gene at genehammett.com and send me an email. I'd love to get to know you and see how I can help you. As always, lead with courage. We'll see you next time.